Kenneth the Nod. We are finally kicking off, man. Thank you so much for the time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I really me. appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, for um, sure. For everyone out there, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, sure. So my name is Kenneth Anand. Um, I am a fashion streetwear and sneaker consultant. Uh, I spent my last two and a half years at the Yeezy brand working for Kanye West and his fashion label, first in a legal capacity um, as general counsel of Yeezy Apparel and then uh, as head of business development. And uh, you know, before that I practiced law for 15 years with fashion clients, entertainment, business, which really prepped me for my work at Yeezy. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. We really want to give some tidbits to designers that are looking to go direct to consumer uh, within the future. Sure. Um, you know, so I guess let's start off with my first question, actually. Mm -hmm. So how was it working for today's Steve Jobs? Yeah, so um, first of all, probably the most inspiring and uh, motivated time of my professional career was at Yeezy. Um, I think it's pretty easy to understand why, you know, I think he inspires so many people in day-to-day -day life through his music, through his design, through his, his general ethos. But for me to see it from an insider's perspective and the business behind it um, was phenomenal. I knew that when I set foot in the business of Yeezy, I had to quickly scale up my knowledge on the business aspects of things and use my legal, you know, legal skills to contribute to the brand in the ways that I knew how. And, uh, and that morphed over time. So, you know, super inspiring. I mean, there's no one that's doing more, I feel like, in um, art, culture, design than Kanye West. So, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, it was dope. And it's, it's amazing because I don't think any uh, lawyer really saw or sees that trajectory to the position that you found yourself in. Yeah. Um, give us, you know, understanding of how you got there. Sure. Is it something that from a young age you always aspire to be? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, my career has really come full circle in many ways. Um, when I was young, like in middle school and high school, I was really into hip hop music. I was really into hip hop culture. Um, hip-hop fashion, you know, middle school and high school years, all I wanted to do was be a music producer. You know, I was chopping up samples and like freestyling with my friends and, you know, I just, I loved it. I fell in love with the culture and so, um, you know, I went to, I went to uh, college thinking number one, I would get a college degree, but number two, I would continue producing and trying to make it in the music business. So in college, I had a I had a band that I produced for, and we used to play at frat parties. And what was the name and, of the band? Uh, it was called Two Hundred Proof. Two Hundred Proof. There yeah, you go. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a slight nod to uh, alcohol abuse. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, you know, that's what college kids did at the yeah. time. So it resonated. Um, but uh, but yeah, and so like just uh, you know learned the inside of a music studio. Um, I took classes on audio engineering. I actually got a dual degree in music and computers along with a, you know, just general communications major. Wow. Um, and so, uh, so when I graduated, you know, my parents both having their PhDs, they were like, what's next? Yeah. You know, and I was like, well, I just graduated. Like, give me a chance to, to figure it out. And so I moved back in with them and I started taking meetings in the city to, you know, with record labels, and I realized how difficult it was to break into that business, mm -hmm. um, even with the experience that I had. And then even if you broke into the business, how grimy it was as an artist, and you know, how it really was set up to, uh, to take advantage of, of artists and creative people. And- uh, So automatically, after college, you wanted to focus in the arts. I did, okay. yeah, yeah, I did. And I, you know, I grew up in a creative household. My brother's a painter. Mm. You know, he went to RISD and I just I just have like a bleeding heart for creatives. And so after struggling to make it in the music business and having some minor success, um, you know, I realized that my path and my strength was in supporting creatives like my brother, like other people like myself who were struggling in the business. And so I enrolled in law school and uh, I went to Brooklyn Law School to pursue a, a career in law. So, um, and you know, I remember just showing up the first day of school and like looking around and just my 
personal aesthetic was much different from the people that I was in class with. Yeah. Um, you know, I was just this, this uh, you know, middle class kid that loved hip hop and I was thrown in a very corporate and very homogenous world. Yeah. So I showed up the first day of school wearing like, you know, a track suit, uh, a powder blue, you know, velour track suit. And, uh, and I looked around, I was like, well, this isn't gonna fly for law school. Yeah. So I had to I had to change up a little bit and uh, assimilate. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that really prepared me for the corporate world and going into a law firm and you know and I feel comfortable just as comfortable wearing a suit today as I do um, you know wearing sweats and sneakers. Uh, I prefer to wear sneakers and yeah. sweats, like you know. But I understand that there's roles for both, and if I'm gonna be a boss in any industry, it's like. You got to know how to move and shake. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, so that trajectory from law school um, into passing the bar and then going to get a traditional job at a law firm, which I did. Um, I practiced employment litigation first. I was a young associate at some um, very well-known employment law firms in the city. And I did uh, harassment, discrimination, um, you know, employment contracts, executive contracts. Mm -hmm. All of the things that really you need to know from an HR legal perspective, which I didn't even know, but later on will become so valuable when I got to a company like Yeezy. Um, so I did that. Then in 09, I started my own law firm and I branched out and started focusing on employment clients, entertainment clients, intellectual property clients. My wife was an intellectual property attorney. She's a fashion lawyer. She actually helped teach me the things that I needed to know to bring in those clients and actually service them the right way. And so, uh, yeah, just like, um, you know, the growth just kept going and going to more of a generalist perspective for me. And what I mean by that is a lawyer who knows how to handle any legal matter for their business clients. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can't handle it personally, you can refer it to other people in the firm that you're in. But you are the point of contact for all of your clients' needs. And so, that sort of really started helping me get the growth to be like, oh, well, maybe I can go work for a company. You know, and I started toying around with the idea, like I had practiced law for maybe 13, 14 years when I was like, what's next for me? You know, like I'm 38, I'm about to turn 39, I'm about to go into my 40s, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I have this wealth of knowledge, and then I have my passions, you know, like I have the things that excite me the most, and I have my clients that do the things that really I'm passionate about, like sneakers, fashion, music, and, uh, and how do I mold a career for myself that's like, I'm doing what I'm good at, but I'm also working in a space that ignites my passion and my excitement. And, and so, so uh, yeah, I just started focusing on those clients that were in those spaces for me. And uh, sure enough, one day I got a call from, from a client of mine who was like, you know, Kanye wants to hire me as uh, one of his executives, and would you help me negotiate that deal? And, and I was like, absolutely, I would love to. And so, um, you know, went back and forth negotiating that deal for him. And then, you know, he went to work there and I was like, great, you know, I'm excited for him, but how do I, how do I get in there? You know, yeah. like, how do I um, at least get into that uh, Kanye stratosphere? Because I love, like, I, as a fan, like, I just of wanted course. to be a part of it. And... Uh, and he reached out to me, you know, a few months later and said, you know, we have a lot of legal work that we need done and can you help out with that? And I said, absolutely. And I started looking at, you know, how I could help and what their needs were. And I, you know, I threw a Hail Mary out there and I was like, you know, I could do this work for you here at my law firm and I could save you money on what, you know, maybe you're being charged currently. Or you could just hire me and I'll come do everything legally for the, for the company. And uh, you know, it was it was one of those things where it was like, there's nothing, there's no there's no harm in asking, mm -hmm. right? Like the worst thing they'll say is, nah, like we don't have that role for you. Mm -hmm. And I knew they didn't have it because I just knew that the way the company was set up. And uh, I think it, I think I I just like timing wise hit it at the right time because Yeezy was growing so fast. What and year then, was this? This was 2017, early okay. 2017. And uh, they were just in between seasons four and season five. And I was like, you know, let's see what happens. And they were growing so fast and they had so many legal needs and operational needs that, uh, you know, it made sense. 
And so, you know, two weeks later, I had the job. I flew out to L.A. and I got to work, you know. So, uh, so that's basically a, a quick overview of, of how I landed, no, you know, that perfect job. It's perfect because <clears throat> it's interesting. And I would love to know how does it differ from owning your own firm to practicing inside of a yeah. corporation like Easy? Yeah, so, so it's very different. Obviously, number one, um, instead of having a multitude of clients that you got to take care of, I had one, right? So in some sense, the job got easier because I didn't have to focus on, you know, this company needs this thing done or I have to be in court for this company today or, you know, I have to negotiate a deal with it. Like just all over the place. And that's really the skill of a partner who can manage multiple clients and make sure every one of them feels like they're being taken care of. This was, I have to focus on one client, but when your client's Kanye West, like, yeah. you know, there's a lot to be done. And like, this is a guy that knew that he was gonna explode and um, was prepping his company for that explosion. So, you know, there were some things that were, that were easier as a partner in a law firm and some things that were easier at Yeezy. Like I didn't have to bill my time anymore. That's something that partners do. And it's really annoying. I was never really great at it. Um, and then like just handling the day-to-day -day of, of a growing fashion company and all the different personalities and, and lines of business. And, but as I say, like 15 years practicing law in New York City, like that'll prepare you for some, <laughs> some serious work. So I'll prepare you for Kanye. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if anything can prepare you for Kanye, but um, yeah. But I felt, I felt like I was ready. When I think of a general counsel, I think of a, a CEO that touches every facet of the business, yeah. whether it be engineering, design, marketing, sales, um, and the gamut keeps on going, right? Yeah. So HR. Yeah. So in, within that role, uh, was that your day to day at Yeezy? Yeah, very much so. And like, you know, uh, Yeezy was still growing, so we didn't have every little role filled, you know, so there were times where you had to, just as any startup might, you know, and it's, it's weird to think about Yeezy as a startup because, you know, Kanye had an infrastructure and a vision that like most startups don't have, like doors opening for, you know, um, just anything you would imagine being possible, we could, we could make it happen. But uh, at least in the day to day of the business, you know, there'd be a number of things that I would have to work on. And I can't get into detail about, about too much of it, but um, you know, general counsel really has to know what every aspect of the business is doing. And if you don't, you're exposing the company to potential liability. So if your designers are making things that infringe upon other people's um, intellectual property, if your manufacturers are making things that maybe not be in compliance with certain regulations, um, if your own intellectual property is not buttoned up, if your employees are not given the right agreements, if they're not compliant with wage and hour laws, whatever it is, you have to have your hand in almost everything. And that's the role of a general counsel is really to understand the business. And the weird thing for me was before I even got to Yeezy, I felt like I knew the business mm -hmm. because as a fan, as like a, you know, a sneakerhead, like yeah. I knew everything. Like I knew when the drops were coming out, like I knew what releases were to look forward to. I knew like what patterns were on our clothing, like what graphics we had used. So like walking in, the designers were like, bro, like you, you are like the perfect guy for this, yeah. you know? And it was weird for them because they're looking at a lawyer like, oh, this is going to be a stuffy guy. But this was what I was built for, you know, I really felt like that. And so uh, the transition was a, a lot easier as opposed to going into a company that maybe was in a different um, vertical that I was not so knowledgeable about. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, uh, pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. right? Like that's just not my thing, mm -hmm. you know? So, and I may have represented some over the years in a small capacity, but I was all in, like I was a streetwear guy from day one. Mm -hmm. So like, this just made sense. So when I think of Yeezy, I think of like the ultimate direct to consumer yeah. brand, yeah. company. Uh, but like you said, doors are opening really easily for the brand as yeah. you guys maneuvered. But one thing Kanye identified when he was first trying to get this thing started, or at least removing himself from Nike, to Adidas mm -hmm. is that as a celebrity, 
he gets taxed. Like everyone's coming at him, you know, trying to get the most out of him. Um, but when he entered into Adidas, it seemed like he found a family, found a home yeah. for the Yeezy brand, which had me, you know, in, in a from a direct to consumer model working through Adidas, I was wondering, is Yeezy structured as a separate company? Yeah. Um, as a brand. Sure. So uh, I can't really speak to the um, entity and, and, and how it was structured um, because there's, you know, just confidence is there that I, that I can't speak to. And, you know, I was the guy that wrote our NDA. So yeah. like, you know, it would be pretty bad if I was, if I was going into those details. But what I can say generally is like typically the way a company would be set up that would work with, an, with, a, with a brand like Adidas is you would either have a separate entity and you would license your intellectual property to Adidas, like you would license your, your mark like Yeezy or, or um, Assad or you know, whatever it is, you would license that mark to Nike, to Adidas, or you would have a brand underneath the umbrella of Nike and Adidas and they would take care of all that for you. Obviously, you would have a bit more leverage if you did the former setup than the latter mm -hmm. because you would have more control over your IP, you would have more control over your, your company and your setup and, uh, and the day-to-day -day operations. Um, but, you know, there's all different forms and, and shapes of a licensing agreement, of a, of a brand endorsement agreement. So there's really no one cookie-cutter model. And I think what we're seeing today and what's really important for designers to know is that you know, depending on your brand and your ethos and your aesthetic and how you set it up, there's really ways that you can skin this cat um, to make the best endorsement deal for you if you have that leverage, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, Kanye came in with a tremendous amount of leverage and cash, cachet, like coming from Nike and being able to say, no, I'm going to walk away from this to go to somewhere where I think I, it can be the right fit for me. Not every designer has that, you know, ability, but... Uh, you know, there's just there's just so many ways, and I think designers are inherently creative. They need to be thinking about how they do their partnerships creatively. No, I I, I totally agree, and and I, that really speaks to the heart of the conversation today around yeah. how designers can start moving into a business minded uh, forefront and thinking direct to consumer. When we talk about the trillion dollar millennial, I think direct to consumer is the fastest way for a retail brand to get there. When we look at the market opportunity for the sneaker culture or the sneaker business, or even from a, a, a retail streetwear perspective, what would you say the market opportunity is yeah. uh, for a brand similar to Yeezy? Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's obviously tremendous market opportunity. Like we've seen a shift in the way people consume goods. Um, you know, in the last 10 to 20 years in such a massive way. Like um, Yeezy in itself uh, was able to reach its consumer because of its following, because of its, because of Kanye's, um, you know, authenticity and his really, you know, his, his aesthetic. He's able to, he's able to really engage his customers, right? So, so direct to consumer made sense. It's like, why should I pay wholesale, you know, um, a percentage to my wholesalers or to my distributors when I can just reach my people on my own. It's the same thing that a, that a, that a pop and artist might feel like about their mixtape versus, you know, versus going to a record label, right? Like, you know, you might be the chance to rapper of fashion, right? So you might be able to say, look, I don't need these record labels. I can go directly to my fans because I already have that engagement. They believe in me. They believe, I speak to them. I have a, I have a niche that fills you know, avoid in whatever consumers want, right? So like, that's happening in fashion, that's happening with sneakers, that's happening everywhere, really. I mean, in photography, like Instagram, there's so many ways that you can reach your consumers directly. So it's, it's taking the need of the middleman out, um, which is empowering the people selling, it's empowering the designers, and it's giving them more opportunity. So, you know, Yeezy just did what it could do best, which was like reach its people. You know, Kanye has, he had a following before he even went to Nike, you mm -hmm. know, like, and when people were like, oh man, like everything this dude does is authentic. So I know his sneakers are going to be crazy. Right. And then you, and then you release them and it's like, oh my gosh, like I've never seen anything like this. That's the ability of a true creative. 
It's like, you know, um, you know, Elon Musk does that. Like, there's just so many ways. Like, they're taking new, new ways and disrupting and, and reaching their, their consumers like never before. So now's the time. Like, DTC is great. The problem is, is that, like, you got to reach your, your audience. You know, so record labels are doing this. They're making, they're making their artists go and find their following on YouTube, on Instagram, and then they're taking the cream of the crop, not necessarily the most talented, but those who have the most followers, and they're like, yeah, we'll give you a deal. Mm -hmm. we'll, give you, we'll give you an advance, you know, but they've already done all the work, you know? So like, if you can stick it out as a young designer and you can say, all right, I might not get that advance, but there might be a slow and steady path to my continuing to grow my brand on my own, you'll have a lot more leverage like Kanye did when he walked into Adidas. So, but the the issue here, you correlated that to like music, yeah. you know, in a lot of the forms of art, but within the fashion industry, yep. the law hasn't caught up for you to be able to protect your IP. And we'll get into that later yeah. on, yeah. but uh, it's interested in me it's very similar from a, within the music realm, yeah. within um, other industries, but it seems like fashion is still dated from it the is. U.S. perspective on on the legal legalities around it. Yeah, and I think you know the IP laws are somewhat broadening to cover more protection for designers. The problem is that they're protecting the huge conglomerates that have released, you know, um, a multitude of of products that look the same, you know, so a young designer who has something that's really hot and really novel cannot get the same protection as like Nike that owns Converse and has a, you know, a historical and iconic silhouette like the Converse All-Star. You know, like there's recent laws that have, that have protected that silhouette in ways like never before, right? So like people used to come out with like a, a fake Chuck Taylor, you know, like, I don't know, um, you know, Even bait. If yeah, you look at it, yeah, they took exactly. the Air Force One and just changed the check. Exactly. So we're seeing more. We're seeing broad in protection for those kinds of trade dress or like silhouettes and like um, you know other unmistakable iconic looks, like the red bottom on a Louboutin shoe, um, things like that. But but the young designers who haven't proven themselves that are coming out with the hottest ideas that these big brands are copying, they have no protection. You know, and it's even in the luxury houses that are coming out with like hot couture looks and like um, things that are so wild and, and, and really blur the line between a utilitarian aspect of just like a piece of clothing mm -hmm. and like art, right? And, and things that should be protected by intellectual property laws. You know, there's, there's nothing like that yet. And it's a topic actually that's pretty near and dear to my heart because my wife is a fashion attorney and when she graduated law school, she wrote an article um, called Style Piracy Revisited, and her, she was proposing that designers should have some limited time frame, like maybe six months or a year, like the, life, the lifespan of a collection in the fashion world, of a limited protection to say, this is what I'm doing that's so new. Give me some time to like let my design breathe and make some money, and then you can copy it. Yeah. Instead of the fast fashion model, which is like Kanye releases a dope Yeezy sweatshirt, it's and true. then whoever, I don't want to name names, but like whoever will have it on the shelves tomorrow or will have it on their website. And that's frustrating because like I spent all this time, not me, but you know, I, the designer, spent all this time, you know, coming up with this amazing new look and the next day it's gone and somebody else can buy it for the, you know, a quarter of the price. And it's frustrating. So like I do think intellectual property laws and the United States needs to catch up with that a little bit. Um, because there's so much innovation there. Will it? I don't know, because the United States still looks at a piece of clothing as just a garment. Yeah. They don't look at it the same way we do. Like your, you know, your plaid pants, which are dope and, you know, match with your, you know, your inertia V2s. <laughs> like, there's something about that. Like, yeah. wouldn't it be dope if you could protect this look for a hot minute? Like, you know, no one else. Yeah, and, and when you bring up Chance the Rapper, you know, <clears throat> as, one of the staples of going independent within yeah, the music yeah. industry, I start going back and thinking within the fashion realm, 
how can a fashion or a, or a designer go independent? Is that them protecting their IP? Yeah. And what is the equity of that IP? You know, I think I think a designer's IP is really their their minds, right? The mm. creative mind that they have. I think that's the way they should look at it. Like Kanye was never really threatened by people coming in and copying it because he knew he'd create more amazing um, inventions, ideas, designs, and that's for anybody, right? So like, why would why would an artist give their mixtape to the public for free because they want the people to have it. It's like art, right? Like give it away and, and the money will come. And, and when you bring up Chance the Rapper, you know, <clears throat> as one of the staples of going independent within yeah, the music yeah. industry, I start going back and thinking within the fashion realm how can a fashion or, or designer go independent? Is that them protecting their IP? Yeah. And what is the equity of that IP? You know, I think, I think a designer's IP is really their, their minds, right? The mm. creative mind that they have. I think that's the way they should look at it. Like Kanye was never really threatened by people coming in and copying it because he knew he'd create more amazing um, inventions, ideas, designs. And that's for anybody, right? So like, why would, why would an artist give their mixtape to the public for free because they want the people to have it. It's like art, right? Like give it away and, and the money will come, right? Because if you know that in your heart that you're talented and that you can do this day in and day out, it's what you were, what you were born for, then you're not threatened by somebody copying it because you will, you will go back to the lab and come up with something, the next thing, right? So, so I think, you know, the chances of the world, the Kanye's that don't put their labels on things that just say like, you'll, you'll know a Yeezy piece when you see it. Like, you know, they're really taking a risk because they're comfortable within themselves. Like they're comfortable with their own creativity and they know that the next thing they'll do will be even bigger. So when Chance dropped two mixtapes, no label, and then Apple came to him and said, you know, we want you to do coloring book you know, and I keep talking about Chance because it's like the perfect model for a designer. It's like, yeah. yo, like put your stuff out there and get known mm -hmm. and then make H&M come to you, make Uniqlo come to you, make, you know, Tommy Hilfiger come to you and become the creative director and put your mark on that. And don't worry about the end of that because you're going to go on and do the next thing and the next thing. So, Kenneth, are you seeing that happen, happening for designers specifically Absolutely. off of Instagram? Yeah, I mean, Instagram for sure. Like, I, I follow some really popping pages that are like, these are young designers that are making some things that, like, frankly, I as a 43-year-old might not wear, but I see that they're, like, on the edge. And these kids are wearing the hottest stuff. That's street wear in its finest, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like, we never, we never try to appeal to the masses. Like, we try to build something that, like, spoke to us and our culture, which was subculture, almost. It was like, we're not even trying to do what you're doing. So like when one when one designer goes this way, we go that way, right? When they go hot, low, we go hot. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. Or like you know, if skinny jeans are popping, we're gonna we're gonna go back to the baggiest fit. Like whatever yeah. it is, it's like that's that's what streetwear is about. That's what the subculture is about. So as long as these young kids have their finger on that pulse, they shouldn't be threatened. Like they yeah. should know that like they're the next. The problem is that they need money, they need validation, they need that because they want to know that the art that they're, that they're creating is right. That's the hardest part for an artist is to go back to your studio and create and be like, man, nobody's seen this yet. I know how dope this is, but nobody's seen it. Like, so Instagram is giving designers that opportunity. It's like, I just made something and I'll put it out and then like somebody can walk, walk down the street during fashion week and you're like, damn, what is that? Yeah. You know? And there are some there are some kids out the photographers that are they're they're capturing this like they know, and then you're like man what is that and the next the next year, they're on the runway, it's that fast like you know and we see it happen with like with like Virgil you know like from Pyrex to Off White to to Louis Vuitton, to IKEA to to Avion like whatever he's putting his stamp on everything yeah. you know so like, this is the time and 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 the creative people they have that power but they have to believe in themselves, right? And they have to get other people to believe in themselves, which is hard. So with that, right, I, I look at Allbirds, it may not be a streetwear 
uh, but it's a, a sneakerware mm -hmm. or a sneaker company that goes direct to consumer. Yeah. And similar to Yeezy, these guys have jumped zero to a billion within, what, three to five years. So you, you said something for these Instagram designers as far as they need money, they need uh, infrastructure. Is it the VC uh, the firms that are going to establish that trajectory for a jump? Or what is it that allows these companies that are starting direct to consumer, starting off of a website to be yeah. able to scale? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's tough, you know, I, I think we're seeing, um, we're seeing a shift like, you know, the Carlisle Group just invested in Supreme, mm -hmm. um, you know, Farfetch is buying up NGG Group and, and Stadium Goods and, you know, so there are, there are companies out there that know like what will continue to keep them relevant. And so I think if you're a designer and you're scaling your brand and, you know, somebody catches an eye, there's, there's more of a possibility today that, uh, that, that these VC brands and these um, you know, private equity firms, they, they may invest in you. I think it's certainly um, a better chance today than before. It's just still hard to convince the suits that like, you know, you got your finger on it because they don't know what, to, they don't know. They have to be told that. Yeah. That's why we have brand agencies that are like, you know, they'll connect, you know, I don't know, um, I don't know, Coca-Cola with, with the hottest designer to, to do a new can or to like do a brand activation or a party or they'll connect some DJ with like McDonald's or, you know like they need that they need to stay relevant while still preserving their core values right so um, so there will always be that need right there will always be that need and that's why the designers have to know that they have the power they don't control the marketplace but they have the power and so they have to figure out how to stay um, stay relevant and stay true to themselves while growing and, and getting those investments to, to, to bring in money to do what they want. Uh, ahead, I wanted to yeah. talk about Allbirds though, right? Yeah. So like Allbirds, like that's something that like, like deep down inside of me, like it just bothers me because it's like the least swaggy, the least shoe, swaggy shoe of all time. <laughs> but like those dudes, created a niche that like, you know, there's some people that just don't give a shit about fashion, right? Like they want comfort. And I hear, I don't know firsthand, but I hear that they're comfortable as hell, right? And it's all green, reusable. Yeah, yeah, so like it speaks to people and I see them all the time. I see them in my town, like it bothers me. It's like, yo, how could you wear that out in public? <laughs> but that's not me, yeah. like it's, everyone has their thing. Like some people just don't buy into it, right? Like, I'll tell you that a pair of Yeezys is much more comfortable than a pair of Allbirds, and you'll look dope, but some people don't care about the last part, Yeah. right? So Allbirds is that niche, and like, first of all, I don't know how much you can get them for, but I hear they're pretty reasonable, you know? Like, and, and people wonder, like, oh, you know, like, I don't know, Off-White might be super fly, but the shoes might not sell as well as Skechers, right? Now I can't take a look at Skechers and really it doesn't connect with me, but that's a billion dollar business. Yeah. So so like the fact that Allbirds has created something, has found a niche, has sold it directly, has found like, you know, philanthropic endeavors to like put money back in uh, in different ways and like, I don't know, man, like it, like reusable, sustainable, you can't knock that. And if you're a designer that you got something dope like that and maybe it's not, you know, Maybe it's not got the juice like a Yeezy or like, uh, you know, um, whatever else, you know, like uh, Virgil Off-White or, you know, Here you're still a designer. Yeah. You know, somebody designed that shoe and it sold a lot, you know. So I can't knock it, man. Like there's a, there's a path for everybody. And I think that's what a good designer does is find their niche. Like somebody who's super utilitarian, super like... Um, good at product design and, and like comfort and all that, they put that together. So, and they're, they're winning, you know? So, yeah, so that's the Allbirds model. <laughs> <laughs> winning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're not, they're, they sleep at night, right? Yeah, they sleep they're not well. Worried they about, sleep well. They're not worried about being the hottest thing out there. No. And, you know, so 
when we talk about the all birds model, when we talk about the Virgil model, yeah, well, those are two separate models, right? Sure. From a Virgil standpoint, it seemed like he built equity co-branding with other brands, like you said earlier, yeah. to the standpoint that that built his brand. Yeah. For all birds, they just built a channel direct to their customer yeah. Yeah. and based that off of a, a mission. Yeah. Um, now both of them gained equity, um, as far as brand equity, Sure. but how, my question really is, do you see, do you see an ability to quantify brand equity from a a data perspective, from a digital perspective? Yeah. So I think we talk about those suits that are, that don't know, how can a, a, a designer or a brand show it? So I think nowadays the way to show your brand equity is through um, engagement, you know, through Instagram, through followers, through click-throughs, you know, um, there is a lot of data out there. I think it's really hard to put your finger data-wise on the pulse of what's really trendy, what's really hot, and companies have struggled with it for for decades, right? Um, you know, if you're a company like Allbirds, it's it's just about sales, right? It's about sales and like, you know, those reviews when people say this is the most comfortable shoe I've ever worn. That's what they're going for. You know, you got somebody like Virgil, his sole mission is to make anything, any product that you can imagine look doper, mm-hmm. right? And that's sort of the, the Kanye, Donda, like house perspective. Like that's where they were born out of. Like the way Kanye and Virgil looked at life was like, why does this shit look so whack? Like why, why can't this product look better? You know, like why is there not a low top shoe that looks doper than the Roshi, like whatever it is, you know, so like that's their ultimate goal is to make things look beautiful, to bring art and architecture and design to everyday things, you know, so that when you look at them, you're like, man, I never thought something so simple could look so dope and make my life better, make me feel better, make me, when I walk out of the house, make me feel like I have a little bit more confidence, right? It's like, why are you putting on those shoes today? You know, because when you walk down the street, you know, people are looking at them like, oh. And the M3 got their attention. Yeah, 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 you know. I mean, maybe not during the day, but like, you know, at night, you know, like, why did I put on these shoes today? Because when I came into this interview, like, it's like, oh, like, I feel good. Like, I feel confident, right? And so that's what fashion is about to me, you know, number one. And then number two, it's like, how can I make things better, right? Any good product designer, any good architect is going to make something better and more visually pleasing. Allbirds model is not that, right? That's not their goal, but every designer has a goal, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's the difference, I think. And Virgil, like, he's the king of, like, the collab, right? Like, he's, he's, he's trying to collab with everyone to show people, like, yo, I can make your shoe better. I can make your bottle of water better. I can make your carpet better, your, ch- your, your chair better, because that's what I do. So even with the Virgil example, yeah. right, and his co-branding with multiple companies like IKEA making their chairs better, yeah. uh, water bottles making, uh, you know, water feel better in cooler, your hand, cooler, whatever, yeah. whatever it is, yeah. from a, a legality standpoint, should designers be worried in making those partnerships and what kind of things should they make sure to protect when working with those companies? Yeah, so I mean, I think I think not everybody's built for the model that Virgil employs, right? Like Virgil is able to do it in a way where consistently he hasn't watered down his his core values and his aesthetic. Like he's almost overdone it to the point where it's like every time he does it, it makes him look you know, more legit, right? Mm -hmm. Other people, I think if you, if you were to do a a collab with Coke and it didn't come off right or Avion or something like that, you might be like, oh, this dude's sold out, right? Virgil has almost done it to the point where it's no longer a sellout. It's like, that's his, that's his being, like that's Mm -hmm. his whole vibe. So, you know, it's really hard. I think as a designer coming up, it's like, do I want to align myself with this company? Do I want to align myself with this corporation? And what is that going to do to my followers, are they really gonna vibe with that? Maybe, like, do I do a collab with Fila and, and, and are my followers gonna think I sold out 
because they don't like fila? Or are they going to be like, yo, now I really like fila. Mm -hmm. I never did before. And that's what Ye did with Adidas. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I never wore Adidas before Ye walked in the door. I just didn't. Like, I grew up in New Jersey. Texas stripes. I mean, <laughs> I won't say that on camera, but, um, you know, I was a Nike head. Yeah. You know, I grew up with Nasty Nas. Like, you know, that's what we wore where I was from. I got friends in Boston. Like, they were all day Adidas. They would never wear Nike. So, um, but when Ye walked in the door, it was like, oh, shit. Like, now... And then I started looking at Ultra Boost and I was like, man, that's a pretty dope shoe. Mm. You know, I didn't buy any, but like, it was still like, and I think that's the effect that a real designer has on a brand. It's like, are you gonna put some halo effect on this company? Where it's like, all of a sudden, I'm looking at like, you know, soccer jerseys for my kids, Adidas track pants, things that have nothing to do with Kanye West because he stepped foot in the building and I think we can see that, like, that's happened, yeah. you know? So, like, as a designer, you have to you have to say that to the corporation. Like, yo, do you know what I'm going to do for your brand, right? Like, have that. Like, have, be that confident. And sometimes, as an artist, really tough to dig deep down inside and build up that confidence that, like, what you're doing is right and you can put your stamp on everything. But that's what art's all about, man. It's like, bring that out, you know? Like, let people know that, like, you've never seen what I can do until you've seen how I can collab with your company. Like nobody saw a pair of Jordan 1s until um, the same way until Virgil cut cut up the tongue and like sliced off the, you know, the, the, the upper and, you know, I mean, just like wild, like took off the swoosh and put it back on, stitched. Like no one's seen that before. And some people are like, oh, he just rethought a shoe that existed. Yeah, but no one did that, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy for you to say now. Because it's been done. Right. But no one was doing that before. And now everyone's like, oh, how do I cut this up? It's like, come on, man. Yeah. You know, find your own lane, you know? Yeah. So, like, it's really, it's really easy to hate on it after the fact. But it's very hard to think of it before. So, when I, you know, what I would say to designers is like, yo, look at, the li look at life in, in your lens and say, what can I do to make this better? And then go walk into that meeting and say, you've never seen what I can do to your product. And this is why you need to hire me. That is a great approach, and I'm going to play devil's advocate sure. there. <laughs> and the reason why is because when I look at uh, Adidas, we're talking about them, the CEO gets on um, Bloomsburg Report, and he's talking about the latest uh, earnings report. Sure. And the interviewer brings up Kanye West. Yep. He plays Kanye, I don't think he plays him to the side, but he doesn't give yeah. that brand yeah. or that portion of the business yeah. the appropriate, uh, I guess, recognition to what it's doing to the brand. Sure. And Nike was so fearful of him disrupting their whole business based on the attention that he was driving. And I've yeah. seen it across other athletes that have been Nike athletes as well. Yeah. One of my good friends, Calvin Johnson, they could have done so much more with that brand, but they didn't. Yeah. Um, and so... That brings so up, why? So why? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And well, I can, I'll give you my personal viewpoint, and this is not the viewpoint of Yeezy. I don't work there anymore, yeah. so I can speak on this from my own personal standpoint. If I am the CEO of Adidas, and I have my investors, and I have my shareholders, and I have my prospective shareholders in the marketplace, if I get up there and announce that Kanye West is the sole reason why my brand grew five x over the last three five years. What's gonna happen if he walks away? Yeah. And to my investors, or like, what's gonna happen if it doesn't work out, or if suddenly that business declines for some reason? Like, that's utter ruin, right? Yeah. So you have to tell your investors that everything else in the company is going great. And I'm not saying it's not. Like, I'm not. I'm not making any statement because I really don't know how that company's performing other than Yeezy. Um, I can look at it and, and just from a you know, you know, a consumer standpoint, and just from a uh, a fan, yeah. I can look at it and say like, oh, those shoes are selling out. Like those shoes are not, they sat on the shelf. But like, if I'm, you know, Casper, I'm gonna get up there and say, we're the strongest we've ever been. And you know, the sales of, of this have boosted our growth. Soccer has been great. Like we continue, like that's a diverse portfolio. You're not gonna put all your eggs in one basket in Kanye West, because the minute you do that, you're gonna sink your company if that doesn't pan out or, you know, Anything could happen. So it sounds like... Plus he's very mercurial. So like, yeah. you know, you never know how it's going to play out. 
And that's all artists, really. I wouldn't say all, but that is the majority of artists. It's a tough thing to harness, right? And I'm sure for them, I'm sure there's some nights when they sweat, you know, they're like, what's going to happen next? But that's dealing with Kanye West. So, So are designers outside of the brand disruptors? Is social media a possible disruptor to fashion? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think the job of a designer, a, a true a true artist, is to disrupt and to make you look at things in a way that you've never seen anything before. And I only know this because I grew up with an artist in my household who was like, "Why do things have to look like this? You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna put something out there that you've never seen before." And that's like, why do you walk through an art gallery and something speaks to you, or like, you know, you have to connect in a way that somebody's never seen. And that also speaks to them on many levels. So like when somebody like you wants to buy a pair of shoes, you can't just look at the shoe and be like, that's wild. I've never seen that before. You got to be like, that's wild. And I want to put that on my foot. Right. So like that's what a good designer does. And and they are the ultimate disruptors. You know, I think designers are unique in the sense that sometimes they have to depend on brands to, as I said before, validate them, put them on the map, bring in money. You know, um, we're at a time when there's like hundreds of thousands of, of young people out there, young and old, that are creating new models for everything, whether it's a taxi cab, whether it's a scooter, whether it's, you know, uh, a bed and breakfast. You know, they're disrupting everything, right? And so people are either saying, I can take an existing model and change it and make something new by starting a new company or they're saying I have to go talk to this company and talk to them about how to reimagine their existing one right and the former is easier because you don't have to rely on the existing company to accept you and to give you approval to do what what you want to do with their brand right but it's also hard to start a company the latter which is the disruption of an existing brand or company is almost easier because you're saying your infrastructure exists, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna do something new, but I'm not gonna touch what you're doing here that's always been working, right? And let's see how it works. And many companies are reticent to do that, and the ones that are embracing that and can move with that are the ones that win, you know? But also, it's hard to tell a company that's been around for a century or less, you know, maybe decades, to like do do things differently when they've been perfectly comfortable all along, right? We even have more disruption coming to, to fashion brands Absolutely. Uh, as far as sustainability, yep. as far as green energy. Yep. And um, Adidas just made that announcement. I think it was like, what, 2025? The yeah, ocean be... plastics. Yes. Yeah. So all their shoes will be made with ocean plastics. Yeah. I don't even I don't know if they said entirely or at least some component will be made with ocean plastics by yeah. that year. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's great. I, mean, I think it's, it's great. I think it's fantastic. It's part of the Parley initiative. Which, uh, you know... Parley it, Initiative? Yeah, Parley. Can you explain that to us? Uh, I can't, really. <laughs> it's fine. Um, you know, par- I, I wish I knew more about it, but I, I just know that the Adidas Parley um, collaboration is one based on sustainability. Okay. And uh, they've found ways to use recycled materials in their shoes, and they're doing it more and more. And Adidas is trying to find ways, at least publicly have announced that they're trying to find ways and have found ways to, to bring more of that in. And I think it's great because... Fashion in general is a is a business of excess mm-hmm. and waste, and um, you know you have luxury brands that um, when they don't sell through a particular item, they'll burn it. You know, and not only is that terrible for um, you know waste, but it's terrible for the environment, the ozone layer, and the chemicals that are released into the atmosphere. And I know that there are more um, technologically savvy ways to incinerate goods and deal with the um, chemical and waste like that, but it's still harmful to our environment. And we, we produce so much product that never sells and is wasted and, and incinerated. And, you know, the more recycled materials that we can use, obviously, the better. Um, you know, I don't know enough about sustainability to speak on it, um, but, but uh, it's definitely an, an area where we need to explore. Yeah, and, and I don't know that much either, but I see two opportunities out of that. Um, and hopefully you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but from a design designer perspective, I would think that that is a, uh, even a, a larger opportunity for them 
being that they're able to patent a new form mm. of uh, material and reuse material that would have been considered waste and cut cost on sure. on on product or materials. Sure, uh, I, I know that there that there are some um, utility patents on how to reimagine or reuse um, fabric, how to break it down, how to break down plastics, rubber, and 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 make them into garments and malleable pieces of clothing. Uh, you know. I don't know much about it, but I do know that there's always innovation there. And I think, you know, people are using hemp and plants to, to make garments. That I mean, that's been around for a while, but they're doing it in ways that's not as crunchy yeah. as, it, as it used to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, and you could probably make the same sweatshirt I have on with hemp, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I think it's some place that we need to grow. And I think the millennial specifically is much more in tune to this than ever and I think um, you know some of the older generations don't give them enough credit for being socially conscious and like you know on top of things and they are more than more than any other generation concerned with that and I think that there are studies that show that if there's sustainability if there's some social impact to your brand Millennials are much more likely to invest their money in it and so I think the designers that are doing that are engaging their core fan base and their core consumer in a way that some of these older brands may not. And like they're gonna be the dinosaurs and they're gonna get pushed out while new brands come in and say, this is not right. We're not, we're not, we're hurting our environment. Like we can't keep doing this, you know? And speaking of the dinosaurs, like we always say, it's hard to move a large ship, right? Correct. So from a distribution standpoint or a production standpoint, sustainability will change manufacturing for sure. these large companies as well. Sure. If I look at 3D printing, that even allows designers to have more of a production in-house. Correct. Um, Correct. Although I think 3D printing, like you know, is creating a lot of plastic waste. You know, yes. um, it, people are experimenting in their home with like 3D printing. Uh, and I think, you know, sometimes they're not getting it right or that, you know. I've messed up a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, you know, my son has 3, 3D printed a lot of stuff at school and like at summer camps. And like he comes back with this wacky piece of plastic and like we just toss in the garbage, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm sorry if my kids are watching this and um, they know I threw out their artwork. But um, but yeah, like I think, I think uh, with any aspect of technology, we're getting much more granular and the ability to do things at home. Like we have technology in this room right now that's filming this podcast that didn't exist 10 years ago. And it's very easy for a, for a single person to buy that technology and produce a professional quality production, right? It's just like a home studio and music. It's just like, you know, you don't need to have a dark room in your house to, to make pictures, to make pictures right? Like there's just so many ways. And so we're seeing that even in even in fashion, right? Like you can make garments at home much easier. Um, there's the technology you can make. You could probably make a shoe, you know, um, easier than you could. You know, you don't need a whole factory. So, uh, so yeah. So like, it's it's a it's a wonderful time. Like everything's being disrupted and 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 being put in the hands of the the, the people making it. With any aspect of technology, we're getting much more granular and the ability to do things at home. Like we have technology in this room right now that's filming this podcast that didn't exist 10 years ago. And it's very easy for a, for a single person to buy that technology and produce a professional quality production, right? It's just like a home studio and music. It's just like, you know, you don't need to have a dark room in your house to, to, make, pictures, to make pictures, right? Like there's just so many ways. And so we're seeing that even in even in fashion, right? Like you can make garments at home much easier. Um, there's the technology you can make. You could probably make a shoe, you know, um, easier than you could. You know, you don't need a whole factory. So, uh, so yeah. So like, it's it's a it's a wonderful time. Like everything's being disrupted and 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 being put in the hands of the the, the people making it. So, continuing this technology um, road that we're on. Yeah. Are you seeing AI? In, engage into the fashion industry as well? Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing it. I mean, I think, you know, it's largely coming from the technology companies that want to engage with fashion rather than the fashion companies themselves. Okay. So, um, 
for example, like I saw StockX did like an AI Yeezy thing where um, you could place the Yeezy on your foot mm. to see how it looked with your fit. And, I mean, reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, and then, and then, so that's AR. And then, I saw actually uh, Gucci do the same thing with their app. As right, well, right, yeah. right. Yeah. So, um, you know, and then and then there's all kinds of data, you know, mining and, you know, other, um, you know, automation that you can put in place to to really, you know, grow your brand in a separate way. For me, I just see that that the the product is the core yeah. and everything else is kind of like the fluff around it. Mm-hmm. And if that helps, that's great. But if your product sucks, I don't care how much AI you have, yeah. like, you know, I'm not going to wear your clothes. Right. So, you know, I think I think that's the thing. Like there's so many techies that want to come into different spaces and say, I can make your thing cooler or I can engage your brand better or I can put different metrics around it. At the end of the day, if your product's not authentic and if you're if you're not making some bomb ass, you know, clothing, you know, it is what it is. So number one is just great product, great design. Yeah, I mean I think that's what that's what people connect with the most, you know. So it's like, why would you buy a Gucci um, loafer? It's like, because you know that the the craftsmanship is there. You know that the the leather, the quality is amazing. You get what you pay for, you know? Uh, some people might not agree with that. Some people might not be down to spend that much money on a loafer. But, like, I know, you know, people that, that do are, like, very, like, they're brand, you know, brand lifers. So, you know. This is really helpful for a young designer to know. It's like, you know, Kanye has always said, and this is public, this is not anything like, you know, secret, but Kanye has always said that more designers, more artists should have less managers and agents who just take their cut and more CEOs, heads of business development who actually bring revenue to the table, who bring something, who offer chance for growth as a brand, right? If you are a celebrity and you have a brand, like most celebrities do, every celebrity wants to create their brand, right? It's like, you know, your brand might just be like you're a damn good actor, right? And maybe you don't want to sell products, you just want to act. But if you're a celebrity that wants to create a brand, a fashion line, something like that, why would you just have somebody who takes their cut of that? Why wouldn't you bring in somebody that could actually grow your brand for you? You know, like that's what Kanye has done. He's created an infrastructure of growth. And that's what more people need to do. And that's why you see people like, you know, I don't know if it's, it's, it's Virgil who just aligns with the dopest lawyer, like can get his deals done. Like surround yourself with people that are going to grow your brand, right? So like that's what celebrities need to do in my opinion. And that's what I want to do going forward with my career is like, you know, support creatives to build their brand in ways that are, that's authentic to them and show them that like these deals can be done the right way. So like, what do you need? You need a good lawyer, you need a good CEO, you need a good, um, every, every, every celebrity should look at themselves as a business. It's like Jay-Z said, you know, I'm not a businessman, I'm a businessman. Like, you know, that's, he knew that from day one. Mm-hmm. He's not the one running everything. He has many different businesses that are all run by different people that he trusts implicitly, like people that he grew up with. And then he's brought in other people with talent. You know, I'm sure he has lawyers on staff. I'm sure he has business development people. I'm sure he has agents for Rock Nation. Like that's what you need to be looking at, right? So that's basically that's basically the model. It's like Kanye's always said that. He's like, man, like, you know, I need a CEO. I need a CEO to grow my business. I need a I need a business development guy. Like, you know, and uh, and more artists need to think this way. They need to stop saying, like, you know, my manager is just gonna like, you know, manage the stuff that I do, you know? Right, yeah, you can do a lot because you're the artist, but it's tiring. Like it's you know it it, it wears you down to be like I got to do everything. Why isn't my CEO bringing in business? Why isn't my sales guy you know out there selling my merch? You know like artists always have to do things on their own because it's just it's just the life, man. It's like so hard to be an artist because people don't believe in you, right? So they have to do everything themselves. They need to start surrounding themselves with people that believe in them and can add to the puzzle can add to the to the brand, right? And the next thing you know, you've grown a conglomerate, you know, a conglomerate that's like it's untouchable. It's like I don't have to go call it McDonald's anymore. I got my own business, you know? So we're talking about building infrastructure with empathy. Yes. That's the that's the way I'd like to do it. Yeah. That's the way I believe it because I empathize with 
every creative person that's out there. I know the struggle. I know how hard it is, right? It's like, it's, 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 it's a, it's a grind, you know? And like, um, a lot of people don't empathize with artists because they don't understand them. People look at them like, you're, you're a freak. Like, you know, why are you dressing this way? Why are you wearing your hair this way? Why are you, why are you rapping this way? Like, I don't understand it, you know? But most art is not understood until years later, you know? But these are the people that are paving the way and then they get, you know, um, like leached off of until like, you know, that's why we got unique little collaborations with Basquiat. It's like, man, nobody was checking for Basquiat when he was out there. People were looking at him like he's crazy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He thought he was a madman and it drove him to death, you know? Yeah. So like, we gotta stop doing that. We gotta put infrastructure around the artists and realize that these are the people that are really they have their finger on the pulse of everything. They just don't have the infrastructure to grow because they don't know it. That's why I went back to business school after practicing law for 15 years. It's like, yo, how can I be a more valuable asset to artists and creative people? Because they need to know, like, they don't have that, they don't have that structure in their brain to be CEOs yet. Yeah. But they can be taught that. Yeah. You know, and maybe, maybe like the 10% that they spend on running their business is enough and they have other people around them. But if they don't know that, they continue to get taken advantage of by people that just wanna suck money out of them because they draw all of the income. They, they bring it in, because they got the swag, they got the juice, they got the art, creativeness, like everything. And somebody comes around and is like, yeah, I can help you. It's gonna cost you 25%, it's gonna cost you 40% for this deal. And next thing you know, they're getting screwed, right? So like, just, just more about like helping, you know? Like that's, that's the way it should be. And that's the main reason why we're doing this interview, right? We want to help the designers, yeah. specifically from a millennial's perspective, because I do believe that the transformation is here through direct-to-consumer. And the fastest way to uh, moving your brand is by creating empathy or having empathy, creating equity with your customers, um, and, and it's setting up the infrastructure to allow that to happen in an organic way. Right. Um, so, you know, Kenneth, I, I really appreciate your time, man. Yeah, um, likewise. I don't want to take too much of it. I know I already did today, but before good. we end, you know, I just want to kind of ask you um, if there's anything else you would like to share uh, with our audience based on the premise of what we've been talking about today. Yeah, I just think, um, you know, for me, I've had enough years in this game and doing a bunch of different things to like, you know, really be able to say that if there's something that you're passionate about as a young designer, entrepreneur, or whatever, like you have to go after it. You can't be, you can't be, you know, deterred because it didn't work out the first time or, or the second time or the third time. Like, you know, life is about failure, right? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta learn from it. You gotta grow from it. I try to teach that to my kids. It's like, you didn't make the team this year. But you try hard, you come back next year, you make it next year. It doesn't mean that you weren't worthy. It doesn't mean that you weren't, you know, you didn't have the skill set. It's just about the grind, right? Like most of the people give up early. You know, like anybody who follows Gary Vee on, on like Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn, it's like that dude is like giving nuggets every day. It's just like it doesn't make him more talented. It just makes him more resilient and more like, you know, willing to, to not stop. And so like for me... That's what the growth has been. And I got sidetracked for a while, but not really sidetracked in the sense that I wasn't doing what I loved. It was just like I was building something that enabled me to pivot and go help people in the way that I can now. So I'm a savvy lawyer now. I'm a savvy business dude. And like, you know, I have that ability to help. As a designer, don't ever feel sidetracked because you're not doing exactly what you want to do. Think about what you're doing now and how it contributes to you as an individual so that when you get there, you have much more of a skill set. You have much more, um, you know, confidence or ability to move. And so, you know, it's like it's like when when Ye was working at the Gap. You know, he was selling retail. Who would have thought that years later that would help him when he was selling his own clothes, right? But he's working at the Gap at the time and thinking maybe this is not where I need to be in my life. But years later, it's like yo, I should be running the Gap. You know, so like, life is about twists and turns and there's no telling like I try to tell the young kids like I speak at law schools all the time and I say you know don't get discouraged because your first job might not be exactly what you want don't get discouraged because you're a young designer and 
you know, you didn't get your brand off the ground immediately. Like think about the path and like what you're doing to grow, to get to where you want to be. Like I'm 43 years old, loving life right now and doing exactly what I wanted to do. And it wasn't always like that. So, you know, just don't get discouraged and keep pushing. Awesome, man. So what's, yeah. what's next for you? And um, how can our audience keep in contact with you? Yeah, sure. So um, well, I'll answer the second question first, which is a little <laughs> bit easier. Um, you know, you can hit me up on LinkedIn or I'm on Instagram if you search me. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I try to be as good as possible responding to LinkedIn. Uh, I get like 100 ads a day. It's, it's getting a little out of control. Um, but, but you do respond, and I, I, I will put that shout out to you because yeah, I really yeah. appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I try to. I try to, especially if somebody's persistent and like has something that connects, you know. Um, but what am I doing now? I mean, you know, I'm just trying to stay in the fields that I'm that I'm most excited about, which is fashion, streetwear, sneakers. And there's a couple of things on the horizon that uh, you know hopefully will pan out soon. But I don't want to speak on them yet. So awesome, man. Um, yeah, stay tuned, man. No, definitely, we will be. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, Hey, again, thank you for the time. Yeah, man, likewise. Really appreciate yeah, it. It's a pleasure. Yeah, same here.